Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And welcome to the opening session of our webinar series, Understanding the Impact of Israel's New Government at Home and Abroad, Part One, Overview, Reflections, and Predictions. My name is Ron Halber, and I'm the Executive Director of the JCRC of Greater Washington, which serves as the public affairs and community relations uh, arm of the organized Jewish community in our nation's capital. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you who are joining us here today from around the country, Israel, and around the world. I would also like to thank our partners throughout this webinar series, the Israel Policy Forum, the Greater Washington Forum on Israel-Arab Issues, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. A special thank you to Adam Odessa, who's behind the scenes here and making sure this all works, the director of our Dr. Stuart Lessons Israel Action Center for putting together this terrific series. There are some great speakers lined up for our entire series, so I encourage everyone to join us. Our series today, our series begins today, a little over one month since Israel's 37th government was sworn in back on December 29th of 2022. I would imagine everyone on this call, or at least most of us here, know about that Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is Prime Minister again, leading what is considered by many objective observers as the most right-wing and religious government in Israel's history. We're happy to bring back our dear friend, Ambassador Dennis Ross, one of a kind, to provide us with an overview of the impact of the new government. Ambassador Ross is counsel and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He has served in many positions under several presidents, including Bush, Clinton, and President Obama. And Ambassador Ross has played leading roles, if not the leading role, in shaping U.S. government in the Middle East, the U.S. policy in the Middle East and the peace process, and dealing directly with the parties in negotiations. The ambassador today will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, and I'll follow up with a question or two to begin our conversation. For the last half hour or so, we will be taking questions. Please submit it through the Q&A feature. Please keep your questions short and to the point so I can get to as many of them as possible. And I'd also like to note this call is being recorded and closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. And it will eventually be on our YouTube site for you to view again if there are things you'd like to listen to again. Ambassador, once again, thank you for joining us here today. So much to talk about. And now the screen is yours. Okay, Ron, always good to be with you. Thank you, sir. You know, there is, as I said to you before we came on, there is an awful lot to talk about. And as a former negotiator and mediator, I have the capacity to speak for very long periods of time, not repeat myself, not take a breath. Uh, it, becomes, it becomes just a sheer monologue, and we're not going to have that today. I'll, I will try to control myself, uh, so we actually do have a dialogue. But let me, I want to frame a lot of the questions that people may have by looking at a, a series of issues, but I want to start with the mood in Israel. I'm just back from being in Israel. I was there as the new government was, was being installed. Having a vibrant debate in Israel, not new. Having deep polarization and, and debates over issues, not new. What is new, and I have to say, this is kind of a remarkable statement coming from me. I have never seen the debate and the polarization in Israel so emotionally charged as it is today. And the reason I say that is because it's clear that in the eyes of, in effect, both sides of this debate, the stakes are enormously high. We are seeing people make the case that democracy itself is at stake in Israel. And they're not making that over the issue of any foreign policy question. That's not about Iran. It's not about the Palestinians. It's not about the Abraham Accords. It's about the judicial reform proposals. Those in the opposition will say these are not reform. These are radical uh, reforms that threaten democracy itself. We, we have the current president of the Israeli Supreme Court who says this will turn Israel into a hollow democracy if these reforms are enacted. So I want to start by making a note of that, but I want to start by trying to explain the reforms themselves because I think they are caricatured. Uh, and I want to I want to explain them and put them in some perspective. There are basically four provisions to these reforms that the justice minister, the new justice minister, has has pushed. Uh, the first would make the selection process of the Supreme Court justices much more political than it is today. There is a there has been a judicial selection committee that has been dominated by Israeli lawyers. Uh, 
in the last few years, there was an effort to begin to introduce more of a political component into it. So there were a couple of political appointees suddenly put onto the committee. The committee is a committee of nine. And then there were, with the reform that is being suggested, this would be changed, it would be changed fundamentally. The, the nine would remain, but seven of the nine would be political. So that political criteria would obviously be shaping this. Of the seven, six would be from the from the existing coalition, one would be from the opposition. Ambassador, does this have does this in any way simulate how the American Bar Association rates judges in the United States? Because it's different because it, it what's happening is that the historically it's the equivalent of the Israeli Bar Association that has a, a lawyers committee that selects that looks reviews the judges who might be candidates and then makes a selection. So it's oh, okay. a non political process. This is being turned into a Got political it. process. And so Got there it. are those within Israel who say, look, this is a distortion of democracy. This threatens democracy, it threatens the independence of the judiciary because these will all be essentially political judges. And we can say, we can make the debate, we can argue that maybe it's not smart, but you can't say it's anti-democratic because other right. democracies, this is the way other democracies- Including us. Exactly. So. You can understand why this is this is such a wholesale change. You can understand why it draws a reaction, but you can't really say it's anti-democratic, right? So that's the first provision. The second provision is in all the ministries now, there are legal advisors. The legal advisors in all the ministries answer to the attorney general. The attorney general is appointed by the prime minister, but it also historically has been largely seen as an independent actor, uh, not someone who is the prime minister's lawyer, but someone who advises the, the government as a whole on what's legal. Now, the, this reform would say these legal advisors in the ministries will answer to the minister, not to the attorney general. Here again, you're taking what was a kind of nonpartisan position uh, and, and you're making it more political. But here again, can we say that this is a anti-democratic move? Yeah. I can tell you, every uh, State Department, of which I was a part of for a long time, has a legal advisor. Who picks the legal advisor? The Secretary of State. That's true for the legal advisors in, uh, in other ministries. Now, one of the arguments in Israel is, yes, but these legal these legal advisors in these ministries are really more like your inspector generals, who really are independent. We have independent inspector generals uh, in every department. Uh, but again, the title is legal advisor. We have legal advisors in our department. So again, you can say, maybe not smart to turn this into something that's exclusively political, but you can't really say it's an anti-democratic move. The third provision would, uh, would end the standard of reasonableness. When Aharon Barak, who was a very activist judge, was the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, he developed the standard of reasonableness. Israel does not have a constitution. It has basic laws. Uh, and the reasonableness relates to how the decision or the legislation would affect the spirit of the basic laws. And one in particular that has to do with, uh, in a sense, uh, liberty, civil rights, and, and dignity. Uh, and here again, we don't have quite the equivalent. So it's kind of hard to say, gee, compare it here as a democratic, anti-democratic. It is clearly a change. Uh, it clearly would would reduce the the weight of the Supreme Court in these kinds of issues. Uh, but I would say this one again is maybe more ambiguous in terms of its effect. So your but commentary, actually, a lot of people were asking me when the Supreme Court ruled that it would be unreasonable for Ari Derry to serve in that position. People were saying, what, what kind of a decision is unreasonable? But that just reflects what you're saying right now. There is, there is a standard. There, and so what they're saying is, we want to do away with that standard. Um, now, there are some who say, okay, maybe it's been overused. Maybe it should be reduced in terms of in its, its scope. Maybe mm -hmm. it should be applied to a limited set of issues, not all the issues it's been applied to. But again, I can't, it's hard to say, all right, that's an anti-democratic move. Now, the fourth provision is an anti-democratic move because it would permit override of the Supreme Court by a narrow majority of 61. Now, you just, when you introduced me, you said, this is a, the most extreme Israeli government, both in terms of far right and in terms of the religious. Uh, and so you, you take 
a, a government that is extreme and in many respects on social religious issues outside the mainstream, and they can impose what they want, they have a simple majority, doesn't matter what the Supreme Court would say if this override provision is adopted. It's a basis to provide what would be majoritarian rule. It would provide no real protection for minorities. So this one, I think it's fair to say, this is an anti-democratic move. Now, if you ask me, will there be a compromise uh, on these issues? The opposition is very intense. That's why we're seeing these very large demonstrations, even in the aftermath of the terror attack in Jerusalem on, on Friday, last Friday night, which seven people were gunned down, seven people were killed, more were wounded as they came out of a synagogue praying on Shabbat evening. Even in the aftermath of that on Saturday night, you still had close to 100,000 people demonstrating against the Jewish reforms uh, in Tel Aviv. Because again, there's a sense of what's at stake. Both sides are staking out positions right now, as you might imagine before a negotiation. Look, I can tell you as a negotiator, what do you do? You, you never want to give away a readiness to compromise too soon because it, it suggests that you're too willing to give up your positions. So both sides have kind of staked out hard positions on this. The president of Israel, uh, Bougie Herzog, uh, is the one who is trying to create a dialogue and trying to create a, uh, in a sense, a mechanism in which there can be a compromise on these issues. If you ask me, will there be a compromise in the end on some issues? My answer would be yes. If you ask which of the ones that you're most likely to see a compromise on, it would be the fourth one. The one that I identified as being anti-democratic. Any chance that could be a super majority that would prevent like a, like a 75 or? It won't be that, it won't no. be that. But it could no. be, it could be you know, 65, 67, mm. maybe 70. But there's something else. The way the provision has been drafted, all of the Supreme Court justices, if you want for them not to be overridden, all have to agree, <sighs> which is an right. impossible standard. Right. Because uh, there's actually, I think, 15. So if you if you ask me, you could see instead of 61, maybe it's 65 or 66. Uh, and instead of all 15, maybe it's again, you can't, as I said to people when I was out there, look, you can't say we're just taking the American model. And then when it comes to the override, you're ignoring the American model. The American model, it's a simple plurality, a simple, you know, as long as there's more judges that vote for something and against it, that determines the decision. We've had so many decisions that are 5-4. So you could do, if you're going to take the American model, then be consistent with it. And if you ask me, we'll end up with a compromise that has probably three elements on this provision. One will be a number higher than 61, maybe 65. Some will say closer to 70. But even when you're getting up to 65, it exceeds, it exceeds the existence, the, the numbers in this coalition. Uh, secondly, I suspect that we will see an alteration that all the Supreme Court justices would have to agree not to be overridden. I think you'll see something, you know, that's maybe, uh, maybe not a simple majority, but maybe out of the 15, maybe nine. Do you think 65, let's say the threshold of 65 were put into effect, do you think that would be, from your perspective, uh, 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 enough to safeguard Israel's democracy in, in as far or, or I, I rather the... Judiciary is independence. I would rather have it 67 because it's hard to, there are very few governments that will be, if you get to 67, you're already, you're going to have to incorporate some of the opposition in a vote. And that's really what you're looking for, that it, right, right. it can't just be the government. There's going to have to be some people from the opposition as well. But I think a combination of those two issues, and maybe there's a, I think there's a third provision that may, you may see emerge. You may see that they'll say, uh, the Supreme Court can't be overridden on a certain set of issues. So in other words, there may be some issues where you say it's okay to override if they're seen as being inherently more political, but if they relate specifically to the rights of individuals, that those can't be overridden at all. So in a sense, I'm saying there may be even a substantive dimension to the compromise, not just a numerical one. But I do believe a compromise will come Unfortunately, like in high stakes negotiations, they usually come at the uh, one minute to midnight and you hope everybody's reading the clock the same way. Uh, I used to say, Bill Clinton once asked me about Arafat, you know, when will he compromise? I said, 
one minute to midnight. The problem is he tells time very badly. So it's actually three in the morning. <laughs> we'll have to see when it relates to this. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the first general observation on what's going on there. Secondly, I wanna say something about the government. This government, as we've already referred to, is more extreme because it also has uh, the representatives of what's known as the Religious Zionist Party, which is a, actually an amalgam of two different right-wing, extreme right-wing parties. These are people who are basically followers of Mayor Kahana. Uh, and uh, one, Ben Gavir, wasn't permitted to be in the, in, uh, in the military, in the, ID, in the IDF, because he was seen as being so extreme uh, that he, he fell outside the pale. This is someone who, uh, in the demonstrations against Rabin, at one point they jostled the, the car, the limousine that Rabin was in, and he tore off the, you know, the, uh, on, on the Cadillac, he, he tore off a hood ornament and held it up and said, if we can get this, we can get him. I think, I think of all the things that I've been reading as an observer of the Middle East and reading for years and studying it, the thing that I find the most incredulous is that a man who was unfit for military duty in, in Israel, which is obviously a place where there's university, uh, almost near universal conscription, didn't serve. And he's in charge of the police. And that, to, to me, it's mind boggling. He is, he is the minister. They changed the titles. He's Minister of National Security. Right. And he has responsibility for the border police, although it turns out any operations in the West Bank that involve the border police are still going to be under the, under the IDF, not under him. But questions I heard when I was there is, when there are these price tag attacks, meaning there are extremist settlers who will go and, and basically rampage through Palestinian areas in, uh, if there's been some kind of terror attack. Uh, and in fact, there's been some, uh, basically 144 incidents since last Friday night. Uh, and the question was, would they crack down on them? Would they seek to arrest them? Uh, and uh, among the security establishment, there's an interesting open question about that. So you have, you have Ben Gavir and you have Smotrich uh, who are in strong positions, meaning uh, Minister of, of National Security and Smotrich is the Minister of Finance, but he also held out and he, and he, got the, he is a minister within the Defense Ministry in charge of settlement activity, but also at least in terms of building, but also in terms of the civil administration, which is the day-to-day -day that, that deals with uh, specific Palestinian needs and requests. So that raised basic questions as well. When President Biden called uh, Bibi after the election to congratulate him, he raised his concern about the likely presence of these two being in the government and Bibi made it very clear this will be my government. These are my decisions. Uh, they will be my decisions. Uh, and so we have a government where you have an extremist segment that simply wants to annex the West Bank, uh, number one. And you have Prime Minister Netanyahu who has a set of strategic imperatives. Number one, Iran. This is an issue that has been of existential concern to him for the last 20 years. Number two, a breakthrough with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and number three, deepen the Abraham Accords for which he rightly takes great pride. Now, if Ben Gavir and Smotrich were able to pursue what they wanna pursue, the agenda that they have, and that to be fair, they ideologically believe in it. It's not that these are not kind of false prophets. This is what they believe in. You can disagree with it, but there's a depth of commitment here on their part. And they're there and they're sort of determined, but then you have Netanyahu, the way the coalition agreements were written, they were given uh, obviously a lot of power, but what wasn't highlighted very much is almost in every case, the ultimate decision remained the prime ministers. You know, thinking about what you just said, I, I, I cannot see, I mean, obviously BBN takes great deal of pride, and he should for what he did, but those breaking through through the first peace treaty since Jordan, but, the question becomes is that if he's being pulled by the right and he's got to contain the to maintain his coalition and the Saudis have told, you know, many American Jewish groups and other people that we're not far from there, we're, we're close to it, we want to make it happen. But publicly, they keep saying that they need to see progress on the um, on the Palestinian issue in order to give in order to give themselves cover internally. 
it's kind of hard to see how there's going to be any progress on the Palestinian front with this government at the same time with Gavir pulling them to the right, with Bibi saying he's going to marginalize the issue. That seems to be in direct contradiction to his ability to get expand a uh, relationship with the Saudis, which would obviously bring a whole new wave of acceptance into the Middle East. But I think, look, I think the way we have to evaluate this, and this is, here's an indicator for everybody to observe. Bibi in his conversations, as I said, said he would, in a sense, manage this. So you can see if he wants to achieve his strategic imperatives, by the way, he needs the United States on each one of them. On Iran, right. he needs the United States. A breakthrough of the Saudis, what the Saudis are looking for is what they get from us. Right. Doesn't mean they want nothing on the Palestinians, but they're most important to them is what they get from us. Uh, and and in, on the Abraham Accords, if you want to deepen them, you know, you're going to find if these people on the right are, are allowed to pursue their agenda, each of Bibi's strategic imperatives will be very hard to achieve, if not impossible to achieve. Maybe on Iran, we can, I can get into that more in the Q&A probably. Yeah, please do. Uh, there, Israel might still act on its own, but it won't be the same if it's acting without American support. It won't be the same if, if, you, you know, if in, in effect, the United States hasn't done, taken certain steps that might, in a sense, preempt or obviate the need for Israel to act militarily. What you really want, including Bibi, you want to deter the Iranians so you don't have to go to war with them. Now, right now, we're not there, and that's what I'm happy to get into in the Q&A. Do you think Bibi actually would prefer to deter Iran, or do you think in his heart of hearts he believes that they are just monstrosless and must be destroyed, and their nuclear facilities must be destroyed? If you had a, The point is, he understands you can destroy existing facilities and they can be rebuilt. Right. So, and, and no, the, it, this is not, he understands it's not going to be a simple operation where you just go bomb and they don't do anything. Israel will get three, at least 3,000 missiles a day from Hezbollah when they do it. This will make what you've seen from Hamas look like child's play. So, you know, would he like to not have to? Would he like to stop the program without having it, having to act militarily? The answer is yes. Yes. Would he like to see a different regime? Of course. But he doesn't control that. We don't control that. Uh, and what we've seen, there's upheaval in Iran. And it's, it's deeper, more widespread than we've seen before. But the regime through a combination of incredible brutality and coercion on the one hand, and a very difficult economic situation where people, you know, it's hard to go out and demonstrate when you, when you have to be earning everything you can just to eat. Uh, so you're seeing the upheaval in a sense, it's being, it's being diminished. It doesn't mean the anger of the public has gone away, but it's being diminished. Uh, I still think this is a regime at some point that you know, won't last, but is that five years? Is it 10 years? Hard to say. The point is, in answer to your question, deterrence is the most important thing and Israel on its own can't deter it, it requires us. And I wanna, I wanna go through what it would take to do that, but I wanna go through a few more issues first. I'm trying to highlight here, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know, this is his last go around as prime minister. He has no illusions about that. And he doesn't want his legacy to be defined by Smotrich and Ben Gavir. He wants to achieve a breakthrough with the Saudis. He wants to widen and deepen the Abraham Accords. Ben Gavir, three days into this new government, went to the Temple Mount. Uh, and the consequence of that was that the next week, Bibi was going to go to the UAE. And guess what? That trip didn't happen. So you're seeing he will have choices he will have to make. They're not simple choices. Uh, my guess is at some point, these guys will continue to create the kinds of pressures on him uh, that you know, he would look to broaden the government. I don't think that can happen anytime soon because the trial, his trial is still ongoing and those in the opposition who might be prepared to broaden the government and join it won't come in so long as the trial is still there. But I still think at some point during the life of this government, you'll see a broadening of it because ultimately the strategic imperatives that he needs to make uh, are going to be profoundly limited by what he will have to do with, with Smotris and Ben Gavir. Now, to be fair, we did see some signs that he, he imposed his will. Uh, you know, there were a group of extremist settlers who set up a new outpost. He backed the defense minister going ahead and dismantling it, even though Smotrich announced before the dismantling that nothing should be done. 
And at a minimum, there should be a discussion before anything was done. He's a minister in the defense ministry. Uh, his private and public opposition, notwithstanding, uh, the defense minister went and had the IDF dismantle it. There was a settlement that they wanted to divide, which Bibi again vetoed because it looked like you were creating a new settlement. Ben Gavir, in response to the terrorist act uh, last Friday night, wanted to establish seven new outposts for each of the people who were killed. He wanted to organize a march through the Damascus gates in Jerusalem. These were vetoed. So the point is, Netanyahu is, is demonstrating when they go too far, he will limit what they do. And what he will find over time is the more they get stopped, the more they'll press for things. And the question will be, he won't say no to them on everything. And how, is, how does that manage? How does it relate to these bigger issues that are of consequence to him? Now, uh, getting close to the, uh, the point where I should stop, but let me take a few more minutes. Going, we'll do the Q&A. So I want to go over uh, why Secretary of State Blinken just took a trip there. The context of his trip when it was planned was different than the reality that he faced when he got there uh, or en route. One of the reasons that he followed a trip by our national security advisor there, Jake Sullivan, was that in that conversation where Bibi was assuring the, the president that it would be his government, he would make the decisions since his were the hands on the wheel. Uh, I think one of the things that drove the administration was to say, okay, we're ready to give him the benefit of the doubt, but let's not have him come to Washington too quickly. Let's send people out to prepare the visit, but let's also buy time because this will give us a chance to see, okay, here's what you told the president, let's see if that's really true. Uh, and I think that's why that was the context in which the, the first the Sullivan trip and now the Blinken trip took place. Now, obviously, on the eve of Blinken strip, you have a, uh, an act of terror. The act of terror, uh, you know, is a, uh, and, and by the way, not only do you have the shooting that night, the next morning you have a 13-year-old who shoots two Israelis in Jerusalem. Now there's a context, there's an atmosphere. The Israelis uh, since, you know, last March uh, have been going into the, uh, going into Janine and Nablus in particular to make arrests or to preempt acts of terror. Now they're doing it because the Palestinian Authority security forces won't go in there. Uh, there's a, there's a catch 22 here. There's a built in dilemma. If Israel doesn't send these groups in, and I don't know how many people watching this watch Fauda, but if you watch Fauda, it's extremely realistic. And in a sense, what I'm describing is these kinds of raids, they tend to be a little bit larger than portrayed in Fauda, but the essence of them are you have those undercover units that go in there, they're joined by the elite uh, special IDF units, uh, and they go into Janine, they go into the refugee camp there. It's a teeming place. Uh, in the past, they would go in, they would make arrests. Most of the time they would go in, uh, you might have a shootout, but most of the time you'd make an arrest, you wouldn't have, they, there wouldn't be a shootout, they wouldn't kill the people that are going into arrest. That's not happening any longer. Every time they go in now, it's a firefight. And, and it's because it's a firefight, it takes place in a, I said, a teeming environment. It's not a surprise that not only are those that are going to arrest end up getting killed, uh, but also there are bystanders who get killed as well. Uh, and, and then you have, a, you have a mourning tent for those who are killed, and that becomes a kind of rec recruiting tool. Now, the Israelis wouldn't be going in if the PA was doing something about it. The PA is not doing anything about it. Are they not doing anything about it? because they want these guys to act or are they not doing anything about it because they're not powerful and legitimate enough to act? One of the big problems that is driving all of this uh, is that the, the Palestinian Authority has no legitimacy any longer. Uh, it is seen as completely corrupt. Uh, yes, there's anger uh, towards the Israelis, but there's anger towards the PA as well. There's something else that's different than the past. 160,000 Palestinians every day work in Israel or in the settlements. It provides one third of the GDP of the Palestinian Authority's economy. The people who are working in Israel are not interested in seeing everything blow up. To work in Israel, you have to be 27 years or older. So the 18 to 26 year olds who make up the vast majority of those who are responsible for these acts now, who are organizing themselves, who are recruiting, many are college graduates and unemployed. 
completely fed up with the PA, which offers nothing from their standpoint and is seen as illegitimate. Um, it's not only that they, they're corrupt internally, but they offer no vision of what can happen for the future. So there's a level of frustration, but these are also people who don't remember the second intifada, where 3,600 Palestinians were killed, 1,000 uh, Israelis were killed. But those who remember it are not so keen to see something like that again. They don't remember it. And the place is teeming also with arms. It's flooded with arms. Uh, there's a lot of arms smuggling. You know, there's uh, uh, the arms come from a lot of different sources, mostly arms smuggling, but not exclusively that. Uh, and most of it is a lot of smaller arms. In some cases, the arms have come from Israeli bases. Uh, in some cases, they've come from Palestinian Authority. There's a black market in this. The point is lots of arms, lots of dis discontented people. Uh, public's not joining in, but then for Israelis, what they see is after the attack Friday night, they see celebrations uh, in the West Bank. They see the 13-year-old being called a hero. Uh, and so it, it deepens a sense of disbelief. It is very hard now to talk about producing two states any time within the foreseeable future because there's complete disbelief on both sides. You know, there's new polling on the Palestinian side that shows one third of the Palestinians favor two states. Now, by the way, it's slightly higher than the 29% who favor one state. In Israel, it's, it's also about one third. Is it because, you know, as a, as a matter of principle, people reject two states? No, it's because people have lost any sense of possibility that this can ever happen. What is required right now, Blinken was talking about, we got to get calm, we have to de-escalate. He's right. But part of what is going to have to happen uh, is any strategy to really change things will, will involve some kind of Israeli restraint on the one hand, but only in the context of a serious effort at reform of the PA on the other. In the context where there's a serious effort at reform of the PA on the other, then Israel can rationalize all right, waiting to see if these reforms change the behavior. I would just note, back in 2007, there was complete lawlessness in the West Bank. I mean, complete lawlessness. Uh, and the Bush administration went to Abu Mazen with the donors backing them, the other donors backing them, and saying, you have to empower Salam Fayyad to carry out reforms. And what Fayyad did, he was empowered by, by Abu Mazen. What did, he did, by the way, was to create reforms across the board, but he started with security. In fact, he was advised by many, geez, don't take on that, it's too hard. And he understood if he didn't do that, nothing else would follow. Ultimately, if this is a step that can be taken, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, you need to have a credible prime minister on the Palestinian side who is empowered to who realizes that if they don't change things, we're on a path that is creating a drift that will produce Hamas in the West Bank. Hamas right now is doing is not heating things up in Gaza because there's 17,500 Palestinians who work every day in Israel and they don't want to they don't want to lose that. But they think they're on a roll because they're getting money from the Iranians and they're pouring it into the West Bank not to recruit people to become members of, of Hamas, but simply to sow as much chaos as possible because they realize the weaker the PA becomes, the greater the chance they will take over the West Bank. Well, unless something differently is done, that's where we're headed. It's not just the current problems I'm identifying. I'm telling, I'm basically outlining where this is leading unless there's a different approach that is adopted. So we, the US, the administration needs to organize all the donors. We need to focus very heavily on who could be a credible prime minister uh, on the Palestinian side. That person has to be empowered. Uh, and, uh, and that can be part of a strategy that then calms the situation and begins to create a different set of circumstances. You can't talk about political negotiations in an environment where there's complete disbelief and there's a loss of a sense of possibility, and that exists on both sides. You would not have had Ben Gavir uh, and Smotrich and their party get 14 mandates, about 10% uh, of the vote. You would not have had that, except people were concerned about their personal security. Now they're gonna, they can't demonstrate they can do a better job. They claim they could. You know, right now, if you're in Israel, you're not feeling particularly comfortable from a security standpoint. Many of the many of the acts of 
Shinbet recently, uh, when they've gone in, they've discovered not just lots of weapons, but they discovered bomb making as well. So this is a kind of whole of government effort on the, on the Israeli side, but the donors have a role to play with the Palestinians. There has been far too little attention paid to the need to remake the Palestinian Authority. Everything is sort of put on the Israelis alone. Well, if, they, if there wasn't this level of dissatisfaction and alienation uh, within the West Bank, you, know, you wouldn't see where we are right now. Uh, and it is interesting, as I said, Hamas is sitting back thinking they can exploit this. That can't be in anybody's interest. Okay, I could obviously go on, but why don't I stop there and someone can ask me about Iran and I'll get into that. Iran. Okay. <laughs> and there's a bunch of, I'm consolidating a bunch of questions. A lot of people are saying, you know, obviously BB has been talking about the number one threat, Israel security, including as an essential threat as Iran. What is this? I mean, there were some, there was some, there was a large uh, military gain that were, that the, the United States forces and Israeli forces did the other day, the largest in US of huge drill involving uh, dozens and hundreds, I think hundreds of planes or whatever. Uh, the question is, is that wh what is Israel in the interim likely to do to continue to deter Iran? Uh, what, is there a possibility of a Iran, of a, a, a the JCPA ever coming back or, and will Israel continue to use, you know, what it's been using the best clandestine methods to stop. So if you get basically all these questions are saying, what's going on about Iran? What do we see over the next year or two in Israel doing about Iran, given the um, given Israel's strategic imperative and U.S. and U.S. political and U.S. political interest in the, in the region? All right. So looks, I I want to I want to divide this into different pieces. First, let's take a look at the Iranian nuclear program. The there is no JCPOA and there is no, as, as President Biden said, it's dead right now. Uh, Iran right now has 16 cascades of uh, IR-6s. These are advanced uh, centrifuges, 10 to 20 times as efficient uh, as the ones they use to develop and enrich most of their uranium. Uh, when I say 16, uh, every cascade is 164. Cascades, they don't create an arithmetic increase, they create a geometric increase uh, in terms of enrichment. These 16 cascades, and then by the way, they're not all the cascades, but these 16 cascades uh, with advanced centrifuges are enriching to 60%. 60% has no justifiable civilian purpose. Don't take my word for it. This, these are the words of, of uh, Rafael Grossi, the uh, director general of the IAA, the monitoring the UN monitoring group of, uh, of the Iran nuclear program. So no justifiable civilian purchase. 60% is extremely close to weapons grade. What this means is that the Iranians basically have a zero breakout time now. Now breakout time is not the same as a weapon. Breakout time means a time to create piso material that is at, uh, that is basically at a, at a grade that could produce nuclear bombs. So they're not producing at 90%, but they're producing at 60%. The gap there is minimal. So what's the point at which we say, when the, when the President of the United States says they're not gonna get a nuclear weapon on my watch, what's the point at which we say, gee, 10 bombs worth is too much, 20 bombs worth is too much. By the end of this year, if nothing changes, they'll have at least 10 bombs worth at 60%. They still have to weaponize it, but there's a big difference between enrichment and weaponization in terms of monitoring. The enrichment takes place in big facilities. Even when the IEA is not in there on the ground, we have a pretty good picture of what's going on. Weaponization, even though there's a kind of general consensus between the Israeli intelligence and our intelligence, that it would take them at least a year, maybe 18 months to weaponize, you'll also get an admission from both that we can't be absolutely certain. Unlike enrichment where we know, uh, when it comes to weaponization, we think we'll know. Now that becomes a very interesting question because what if you're wrong? How will you know? When will you discover it? And so the path the Iranians are on right now is one that is putting them in a position where having a nuclear weapon, maybe the Supreme Leader hasn't made that choice, but he's made the choice to put them in a position where they have the option to do it. Now, from an Israeli standpoint, this is not just unacceptable, they're going to have to do something about it. Uh, and, and the question is, how long can they wait? This is not a static situation, not only because they're advancing the program, it's not a static situation because they are also hardening 
all of their cap all of these uh, areas where they are where they're doing enrichment and where their their nuclear infrastructure is promoting the program. So there comes a point where Israel will feel it has to act. So the question is, what is the Netanyahu when he comes to see the president? Clearly, in speaking with Sullivan and with Blinken, this was a major part of the conversation. What is the U.S. approach going to be? Well, one signal that we were prepared to to send a different kind of message to the Iranians was the joint exercise you referred to. There were 142 planes that took part. B-52s engaged in bombing. Uh, Israelis were escorting. There were KC-46s doing refueling. The Israelis need the KC-46s. They bought four, but right now they're not scheduled to get the first one until uh, the end of 2025. Israel needs the refueling because these hardened targets require multiple hits. And when I say multiple hits, I don't mean you hit the target multiple times, I mean you hit the same spot in the target multiple times to break through the hardening. So Israel, to be able to do that, they don't have forward bases, they need to be able to have the kind of refueling capabilities that put them in, in that position. The purpose of the joint exercise was to signal the Iranians, all right, look, we're doing something different, like we're preparing for what might ha have to be these kinds of attacks. I would say if we want to if we want to deter the Iranians or even give the Iranians an incentive to think about coming back to a diplomatic outcome. Uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to do, I would say we have to do four different things. First, we have to change our public posture. Our position right now is uh, all options are on the table. We have said all options are on the table for so long that that's become routinized. I don't think it impresses anyone. We should change that. We should say fundamentally, we still prefer a diplomatic outcome, but the Iranians are demonstrating they're not interested in diplomatic outcome. They need to understand if there is no diplomatic outcome, we will act and they will put their entire nuclear infrastructure, which they've spent the last 40 years investing in, they're putting it at risk of being destroyed. And do we have the capacity to do to take care of it? We absolutely have the capacity to take care of it. Absolutely. Part of the reason for this, by the way, part of the reason for the size of this exercise, this joint exercise, was to send the message to the Iranians and frankly also the Russians and Chinese, we may be preoccupied with Ukraine, we may be preoccupied with the South China Sea and, and Taiwan, and guess what? We have enormous capacity that we can still demonstrate. These were assets not related to the other two theaters. Look what we just did. So that's actually the second item. You, you change your public posture because one message that sends is you're preparing our public and the international community for the fact that we may have no choice but to act militarily and we're putting everybody on notice. The Iranians will get that. So the second thing you do is then you conduct exercises that, that demonstrate the words are not empty, right? So here we are, we said this, now look, we're, it looks like we're preparing and even rehearsing. That means what we just saw shouldn't be a one-off. We need to have follow-ups to it. The third thing we need to do, those KC-46s I referred to, we should put the Israelis at the head of the queue. That will immediately send a message to the Iranians, you know, that not only will we not restrain the Israelis, we're prepared to support them. They need to see that because they still think in 2000, during the Obama administration, uh, we definitely stopped the Israelis. Now, they wouldn't have stopped, except that the Israeli military, they all argued against uh, Netanyahu and Barak about doing it. But one of the reasons was because of American opposition. So the Iranians think, again, we'll stop them. This is a signal that we won't stop them. And the fourth thing relates to us. We have to demonstrate that we're, we're prepared to use force, not just to talk about, not just to do exercises. We have small forces uh, still in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, recently, a week ago, uh, the forces in Syria were targeted by proxy militias of the Iranians. And we haven't reacted. And we did something, I would say, which in my mind is somewhat mind boggling. The Israelis last week, they don't admit it, but they hit a weapons production facility, missiles and drones, by the way, which are going to Ukraine. Uh, they, hit a, they hit that and there was also a weapons convoy, trucks carrying weapons along the, crossing the Iraq Syrian border into Syria, obviously intended partly for Syria and partly for Hezbollah. Uh, that convoy, the, the pilots who, they dropped demonstration strikes so the drivers would get out of the trucks. Then they destroyed the trucks that were all carrying weapons. 
we immediately said it wasn't us. Now I want you from the standpoint of deterrence, this would have been a perfect moment for us to say nothing. Let the Iranians guess. The minute we say, and it was, by the way, it wasn't the administration, it wasn't the White House, it wasn't the State Department, it was people at the Pentagon. There should have been message discipline. There should have been radio silence on this. We want the Iranians to think we're prepared to do things they haven't seen before. This would have been an example of that. You do those four things, you're, the chances of getting the Iranians to suddenly decide it's too dangerous to continue down the path they're on goes up dramatically. I would just note one thing. The Iranians, when it comes to limits, respect limits they believe in. Back in 2012, when Netanyahu was uh, speaking at the UN, he held up this diagram uh, that showed a red line at 20%. Uh, and I can tell you, for a very long time, the Iranians respected that 20%. They didn't cross it. Uh, and in fact, in the initial, the agreement before the JCPOA was called the JPOA, uh, they accepted not enriching the 20%. And it was kind of an outgrowth of that. If the limits you impose are believed, you will find that they respond. Now, does it mean that there can be a diplomatic outcome? I'm not sure. I still think the Iranians, the supreme leader right now, probably sees an advantage in sanctions relief because he thinks he can buy off some of the public that he knows is deeply alienated right now. Now, will he do that? He wasn't prepared to do it so long as there was upheaval? Not sure. And there'll be opposition here because there'll be a sense, why should we provide what would be hundreds of billions of dollars to the Iranians given the nature of this relief, or given the nature of this regime? Uh, this is a debatable proposition, but the, at a minimum, we need, to, we need to be able to deter where they are or there will be. Ultimately, there will be the use of force. The Israelis won't wait forever. The administration clearly is, and the president himself is harder line on the Iranians than he's been because of what they've done domestically and also what they're doing with the Russians. So I think there is a moment where there's a, a decent chance to come to some common understandings. We still need to do more along the lines of what I was suggesting. I want to ask you one more Iran question and then I have a couple of questions about the Supreme Court. Um, do the Russians and the Chinese share our interest in not allowing Iran to develop possess nuclear weapons. Are there any spillover effects with regard to Russia and China and our unilateral actions against Iran? For a long time, I felt the Russians did not want the Iranians to have a nuclear weapon. I think the Chinese don't want it because I think they, they worry about what it may mean in the Middle East. I think the Russian position today may be different. Because Russia and Iran are becoming sort of two pariahs increasingly joined at the hip. Uh, we're, they're now going to link their banking systems, something that was never done before. But the more that Russia's under sanctions, the more they find avenues blocked up. Uh, by the way, they turn to the Iranians very quickly because the Iranians have become expert at evading sanctions. So they, they got tutorials from the Iranians on how to evade sanctions. So I'm not sure they are where they were before. I think historically that's where their position was. I'm less certain of it today. One other question is, um, why are we surprised, comes from Steve Gill, our board member of JCRC, why are we surprised at all about the fact that the Israeli Supreme Court might be becoming more partisan? We'll get our own. I, that's why I tried to draw a distinction between partisanship and what's anti-democratic. Partisanship is not anti-democratic. I don't think that in the end, I don't think it's look, uh, Justice you know, Roberts doesn't like it when people say we have Republican judges and Democratic judges. He doesn't like that. Uh, and I understand why he doesn't like it. Uh, but you can't say it's anti-democratic. You can say the override provision of the Supreme Court is anti-democratic. I think that's where we need to draw the distinction. Uh, look, in the end, Israelis are going to decide this. I, as I said, I think that fourth provision they'll compromise on. Maybe we'll see some compromises on some of the others as well. You know, having seven of nine be political on that committee, you know, maybe that could become five. You know, maybe of the five, maybe two could be from the opposition. There's, there's room for some compromise. For me, the most important one is the fourth provision. What would you suggest is the role of mainstream Jewish institutions, federations, synagogues, JCRCs, in light of the developments to Israel? 
Look, I think one of the things for all of us collectively to, to bear in mind is when it comes to the judicial reforms, we have to understand that the key pillar of U.S.-Israeli relations has always been shared values. It cannot look like somehow we no longer share values. A majoritarian approach and end the separation of powers in Israel, that is something that has an implication for the U.S.-Israeli relationship. We have a responsibility so that that is that voice, that message is conveyed very clearly. It should be as unified as possible, which should not be hard because I think there is a kind of broad collective attitude here in the Jewish community. But that should be a consistent message that goes from, uh, from the federations, the organizations, JCRC, um, the organized Jewish institutions should be a consistent message saying, look, you can Obviously, the issue of how you, how you handle judicial reforms is your business, but not if, if those reforms end up ending separation of powers. Separation could, you, of powers. could you see in any way if these judicial reforms do not come out in a more positive or, say, democratic way, that it could have a dramatic uh, undercutting for support in Congress for Israel, feeling that they feeling that we no longer should I use this as evidence that Israel is slipping away from democratic values, or would it take more than that? Well, I think part of the problem is there's such polarization within our Congress. There will be those who will decide you'll, they'll try to exploit this politically. Now, having said that, I mean, look, I think within the Democratic Party, you already see a segment of the Democratic Party whose attitudes towards Israel are quite different younger American Jews see it uh, increasingly as quite different. If you take away the shared values, you're just, you're accelerating the process of that group expanding. It will certainly create greater partisanship division on Israel, which is not in Israel's interest. Israel has always been an American interest, not a Republican or a Democratic interest. And there's good reason for that because you can have identity with one party, and that doesn't mean the pendulum won't switch, uh, won't won't flip. I mean, think about the following. You know, for most of for, for Israel's, I would say, through uh, up until effectively George W. Bush, it was the Democrats who were the stronger supporters of Israel, and the Republicans who were not. And it flipped since that time. Now what it tells you, it can flip again. By the way, those who, for those who say, oh, well, you don't need the Jewish community, you got the evangelicals. The younger demographic of evangelicals are mirroring the younger demographic in the rest of the country when it comes mm -hmm. to it. So the potential for a swing, a pendulum swing is there. It is not smart for Israel to lose its nonpartisan character sooner or later it will come back to haunt Israel. A strong U.S.-Israeli relationship is obviously in Israel's interest, but it's in America's interest. We don't have anybody else who is as dependable as Israel and as capable as Israel in the Middle East. And anyone who thinks the Middle East isn't going to remain an issue of importance to our national security ignores the reality of what's happening internationally. Question, uh, future Palestinian Authority leader, Abbas is how old? About? 87. Okay, so one can assume that at some point in the near or not too distant future, there might be a replacement for him. Who are the people who are up and coming or, and are any of them leaders of quality that could possibly lead the Palestinian towards reforms and toward a, more, toward a greater reconciliation with Israel? Uh, none of the people on the horizon, but none of them are, are young, by the way. Oh, okay. it reminds me of, you know, the, who was a student of the Soviet Union and the the Komsomol was called the Young Communist League. And the head of the Komsomol was 60 years old. So we gave a new definition to what's young. Uh, all the people who are positioning themselves for the future are not young. There are younger people, but they, again, you have a sclerotic, even though the Palestinian Authority is not old, you have a scler sclerotic uh, set of institutions there. And the younger people within Fatah, as an example, they're blocked from advancing. So, you know, you the most likely outcome after he's after he's gone. And by the way, there is great positioning 
for the post Abu Mazen period, which also affects what I was saying about the security organizations. They don't know what's going to happen after him. And so why go and crack down on those who maybe, you know, could be your leaders later on? So there's a there's a lot of a lot of uncertainty created by that positioning, but there is not, I mean, I can give you names of people. They don't fit the category of what you're describing. Uh, it doesn't mean people like that don't exist. Uh, and in the in the aftermath of Abu Mazen, there may be more flux within the within the institutions themselves. So you may see people emerge who you don't see right now. Uh, I mean, I can I believe we assuming that with the picture I was painting about Hamas taking over the West Bank at some point, uh, in the advance of that, I see a kind of collective leadership after Abu Mazen. He wears three hats. He's the president of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, he's the head of Fatah, and he's the head of the PLO. I think those three hats will be divided between three people. And you'll have a collective leadership because the old Benjamin Franklin adage will apply. We'll all hang separately unless we hang together. So I think you'll see that in the aftermath. The question well, would be collective can't having power diffuse. Oh, I'm sorry, can't having power diffused among three different heads make it actually easier for Hamas to try to go ahead and infiltrate and take control? Well, it could because Hamas may decide to try to you know, partner with one. And one thinks partnering with them gives it an advantage. You could see that. Certainly, mm -hmm. the greater the divisions, the greater the openings for Hamas. Mm -hmm. One uh, one uh, one last question: um, Settlements the role they still play in influencing uh, uh, on the support for America on the progressive side. Um, the problem is the problem has always been this: if you want, if you believe in a two-state outcome, you have to preserve the possibility of separation of Israelis and Palestinians. When you keep building, especially outside the blocks. The, the blocks are real. I mean, in the sense that 85% of all the Israeli settlers live in the area across the Green Line that is on 8% of the West Bank closest to the Green Line. So when you build outside that 8%, you're making it impossible to create separation. If you keep pushing that, you come to a point where you can no longer separate. So if you can't separate, then you can't have two states. Maybe there are different options. Maybe there can be some kind of confederal approach but you're, you're losing the ability to, to separate between Israelis and Palestinians. Those who say two states aren't an option or they don't believe in it, you have to ask them, okay, so what is your option? When you say two states is off the table, you leave one state. One state guarantees a perpetual conflict. Look around the Middle East. I've said this to you before, Ron. Look around the Middle East. Wherever there is more than one national identity, tribal identity, or sectarian identity, those are states that are either at war with themselves or completely paralyzed. Failed states. Syria, yeah. Libya, Lebanon, Yemen. If that's what you want for Israelis and Palestinians, one state is your answer. I don't think that's what anybody wants for the future. One last question. Ambassador Ross, anything optimistic to say about the current situation in the Middle East that should give American Jews hope or inspiration to continue their advocacy and support of Israel at a time when the government seems far to the right, when American values are threatened, and even though you know most American Jews still support Israel, they're, 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 there's a sense of concern about what's going on, something optimistic. Yes, because I can always provide something that's optimistic. I couldn't do what I've been doing for the last 30 to 40 years. I could always say there's something to be done. But let's not lose sight of the fact that Israel had its fifth election in three and a half years and 71% voted. Let's not lose sight of the fact that they, it's, we're not leading the charge against these judicial reforms. It's the Israeli public. You had 270 Israeli bankers and economists, including a Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, saying that if you if you go with these reforms, and specifically it's the override provision, and you lose separation of powers, you're gonna have an unmistakable economic downturn because you're gonna have our credit rating reduced because there'll be a sense that economic decisions will no longer be governed by anything except narrow political criteria. So all these demonstrations, these high-tech people who are out, today there were high-tech demonstrations. Again, the high-tech is a driver of the Israeli economy. But let's trust the fact that ultimately Israel is pretty good at ultimately deciding it's going to remain a democracy. When I said earlier, I still think there'll be a compromise in this. I think it's because the nature of the reaction within Israel itself is going to produce something. 
And even look, even if in the end, let's say I'm wrong about the compromise, there'll be another election, there'll be accountability. You realize the polling today shows that if the elections were made just on what this government is doing, the 64 would become 58. Mm. And one last thing. When I talked about the Arabs, they represent, they want to have a relationship with Israel for their own reasons related to food security, water security, cyber security. Uh, the, the reality here is they want to create resilient economies and they know that Israel is a natural partner. It's not just the security of the military side of this. So again, ultimately, I see Prime Minister Netanyahu understanding he's going to have to make some hard choices. Uh, and look, uh, you got one Jewish state, you don't have more than one. You know, one place, it's not like anti-Semitism shows any prospect of disappearing. You got one Jewish state, you still got to find a way to support it. Something that we deal with, unfortunately, increasingly daily in this area, the DMV, more and more every day. Ambassador, thank you always for your extraordinary insights and, and thoughtful analysis. We will continue to follow closely as things unfold in the Middle East and the region. 